Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Goldberg of Optimist Performance, bringing you practical tips and ideas on leadership, team development, and employee performance in the workplace. And today, also about sales and marketing uh, with Terry. Uh, Terry Dean, let me just get out his bio here. Terry went from delivering pizzas for $8 an hour must have been pretty young, to creating a full-time income online in 1996, which was pretty rare at that time. He is the author of the book, How to Sell Without Selling, which provides a step-by-step -step marketing formula for attracting ready-to-buy clients online. Sounds like a dream, Terry. In the past 25 years, he has personally helped thousands of clients in hundreds of different markets attract high quality clients, spot, spot conversion cracks on their websites, and increase their income even from small email lists. That sounds like something just about every small business entrepreneur can use or be better at. I know I can. It's always an ongoing challenge, uh, the marketing realm. Well, welcome, Terry. I'm really happy to have you on the show today and talk about something that I don't talk a lot about, uh, which is marketing sales, uh, but it's really the fundamental of any business. It's the core, because without sales, uh, without marketing that leads to sales, you don't have a company, you don't have anything to lead or manage. So uh, even if you're a one-man operation, it's so crucial for, you know, I always say the the first rule of the game is is survival and to survive you need clients you need sales so i'm so happy to have you with me um and um how did you go from uh delivering pizzas to doing what you're doing today quick story let's just hear how that transformation happened well first of all thank you for inviting me Stephen. you and um getting started online was <laughs> I was one of the people who had tried a lot of things to go into business. And let's just say I was a problem going somewhere to happen. Like one of my previous jobs before delivering pizzas was even selling satellite dishes door to door. And just to show that I'm not a natural born salesperson, my grand total of selling satellite dishes was zero. I sold none during the time I worked for the company. I got trained. I went out, went on a route and I had no sales whatsoever. Um, I went to start, ended up delivering pizzas. And again, that's another dead end job. I went through a string of dead end jobs. And back then, as you mentioned, there weren't a lot of people succeeding online, but I heard some rumors. I heard some stories of people starting small businesses. And I started online without venture capital, without any money backing by simply going online and looking for message boards. The funny thing was, this is something that people who've been around a long time will know. CompuServe was my first internet provider. And CompuServe had these message boards online, which is very similar to social media today. We can actually say things go in circular. I mean, the way methods we use back then are similar to the methods that we use today. And what I did on the message boards is I went in and started participating in some, some of them. I started answering questions. I started the what really worked for me was answering questions on those message boards and then providing a, what we call today, a, a lead magnet, a free gift. If you come and subscribe to my email list on my website, I started giving those after answering the questions. Again, the exact same approach clients use today on social media. They answer people's questions, they help people, and then they offer a lead magnet on their website to, hey, find more information about this. And for example, if I was talking to a real estate agent, their lead magnet might be how to get top dollar for your, for your home in the next seven days type of thing. That might be the lead magnet that they offer on their website, just as an example. But people would come in, they started joining my list. My very first things that I was selling online was information marketing. Back then we're talking VHS videos. I sold VHS videos from direct mail marketers, from self-help type speakers like Mark Victor Hansen. And those were the products that I sold to my list. As my email list grew, so did my income. And I learned a lot of what I did with marketing and sales by writing online to my list consistently. And pretty much everything else grew out of there. I started helping other businesses, 
basically a couple of years in, people started asking me, how are you doing this? How are you making a living online? And I started teaching others the same thing. I spoke at seminars, I spoke at conferences. And over the years, one of the things that happened in conferences a lot was people would come up and we'd have what we call a hot seat. And that was a first, any business owner would bring their website and they would ask me to look at their website in front of the audience. And we would go through and we'd find out what was working and what wasn't working on the website and give them some suggestions to improve the sales from their website. And basically moving fast forward all the way to today, I've been doing that for all different types of clients and all different types of industries over the years, helping them with the email, helping them with the website, help them coming up with their whole overall positioning and along with the content marketing online. Yeah, and, and like you say, um, you know, it's still the same process. I mean, the process of selling, uh, marketing and selling is still the same. It's just, it's become more refined. There's more tools. Uh, but the messaging still has to be on target to the uh, to the audience. Um, so, what is the typical problem that you help entrepreneurs or small, medium sized business owners solve with your service? What's the most common thing you see, uh, you know, regarding their selling online, you know, through their website or or through whatever means that they're currently doing that uh, you see is the most, uh, the biggest problem that, that people have that your typical client would have? Well, the biggest symptom of the problem, I'll go to symptom first and then we'll go to the right. actual problem. The biggest symptom of the problem is that their website is convert, isn't converting visitors into leads or sales. So not generating the number of leads they want from their website. They're not generating sales from their website. And often they're not sure what in the world is going on and why this is happening. And I'll give you the very first tip that uh, works extremely well in a lot of different businesses is a lot of times people start, this especially happens in professional fields. We'll say for those who are CPAs and accountants or lawyers, their attorneys, they're in some type of professional services. What often ends up happening is they design the website for approval from their peers instead of speaking to their customers. Okay, and what I mean by that is that they write this whole website and they, they take on, we'll say a very professional voice when the reality is a good website will sound more like your best salesperson than it will your best writer. Okay, I, I hope that, that's easy for me to define here is if we took your best salesperson, let's say that right now in your company, you have a salesperson who outsells everybody else on the team, right? I would want their feedback when I was designing my website. I would, I'd wanna find out, okay, how are you selling? Okay, well, what do you say to the customers? What's coming out of your mouth? If I could record their presentation, I'd be close to having a website designed off of it. Okay, I've got their exact presentation. I'm gonna use that on the website. Instead, most people are trying to set up this big professional type website. They worry more about the design than the actual words on the website when both are important, but you have to be making sure that you're making the right offer and you're speaking to the right audience. So think of it this way, a good website is a very personable salesperson. And so that's what I help my clients do is I help them generate more leads, more sales by turning their websites and their emails more into that personable salesperson who's basically sitting down and having a cup of coffee with a prospect. So um, a company sets up a website or they're revising maybe an old design to update it. Mm -hmm. And I, any th investment somebody makes in a website, I know I've made many and I probably should be your client because <laughs> I haven't done very well, uh, you know, marketing myself uh, on my website with the messaging and, and what you just said, mm -hmm. which is key is conversion because uh, you know, you're making an investment, uh, time, money to create this website, and you want it to convert. And uh, if it doesn't, uh, what is the typical cause of that? Is it the messaging? I mean, you just described uh, the wording. Uh, so going beyond the design, what is the process, let's say, to get a website to convert? Okay. I use what I call the golden glove. And I developed this over all those years of being at the different seminars and helping people do the hot seats. 
people would come with hop seat and essentially they were giving me like 10 to 15 minutes to figure out how to fix their website and their conversion. And so I came up with the golden glove out of that. And so the golden glove is a five, I call it the five fingers of the golden glove. So it's the five fingers that you can look at in your hand. So you never have to forget these. Here are the five fingers of the golden glove that we look at. And if your website isn't converting, it's missing one of these five fingers, right? They are a desperate problem. Unique promise, overwhelming proof, an irresistible offer, and a reason to act now. And let me go over each of those real quick. I can give you a question for each one. So desperate problem is who is this for and what problem do you solve for them? That's one of the first things you're going to want to have when somebody lands on your website. Do they know that your website is specifically for them? Do you call them out in some way? Do you talk about a problem that you'll help them solve? Same way that you started this conversation. You asked what problem I could help my client solve. You started a conversation that way. Your website needs to ask the same question in the very beginning. And it's amazing how many websites don't call out who they're for. And a line that I like to say is that if you try to speak to everyone, you end up communicating with no one in particular. So you can't speak to everyone. You have to define, okay, who is my ideal client and what problem do I help them solve? That's the first finger. The second finger, finger is unique promise. So what is your promise? How do you help them solve that problem? And how is your promise unique or different from your closest competitors. Okay, again, we got to look, okay, how are you solving the problem a little bit differently? A lot of times this is done well by defining the root cause of the problem. A lot of my clients will actually go into and we'll discuss, okay, what is the problem that you help your client solve? What's the real root problem here? Because a lot of the others, they might not be fixing this problem. Uh, a good way to define this, let's say a chiropractic office. Chiropractors have to go in and they have to define, okay, here's the real root problem that we help our, our clients solve. This is the problem that we're solving. And in many cases on their websites, they will convert much better if they will get more specific about the problem. What are the symptoms of the problem? And how is the root cause different that we're not just gonna cover it up with drugs or surgery? That's the types of things that they'll talk about. So what's your unique promise and how is it different from what the competition does? Overwhelming proof is whenever we make a promise, we need to back it up by proof. And I even call it proof hiding disease. A lot of websites have proof hiding disease. And let me give you an example. I looked at a website in the fitness field, all right? So this is a fitness website. They, I scanned through their website. There wasn't a lot of proof up there at the top of the website. I said, but we need more proof at the top of the website. We scan, I scanned through the website. They had a testimonial from Arnold Schwarzenegger hidden at the very bottom of the website. And in my mind, that's like, that's like why in the world is this at the bottom of the website? Again, that's a proof point. Let's put that right up near the top. They ought to see his picture when somebody hits the website. You have, a, you have an endorsement from someone that just about everybody knows. You have a celebrity endorsement and you're hiding that at the bottom of the website. It's amazing how many times I've seen the best testimonials hidden on a testimonial page that no one ever visits. And I've increased the conversion of a website simply by asking him, we look through the testimonials, we grab the two or three best testimonials, we move them right to the top of the website. There's a headline on the website, two or three testimonials that back it up. And that improves the conversion with no other changes. And so that's a simple, that's proof hiding disease. Look for the proof. And I'll give this little quick tip also. I've written many headlines for websites that improve the conversion simply by swiping directly out of the client's testimonials. And what I mean by that, as I mean, I read, I read through the testimonials. I saw one of their clients saying that they got this benefit. I said, that's the headline. We're going to take that testimonial We'll word it slightly differently. We'll put it at the top of the page and then we're gonna put the actual exact word in the testimonial right underneath it. That's the intro of the sales page of their website. This, that was so easy to do. So that's the third finger is overwhelming proof. We're gonna back up any promises we make. Anytime you make a strong promise, you need to immediately back it up with some form of proof. That can be testimonials, it could be your background. There's a lot of different ways you can do proof. Irresistible offer is the fourth finger. On the irresistible offer is what, how can you make it more painful to walk away than to invest their money in whatever you're offering? Okay, so we're going to put together the offer. We'll go back and we'll look at the offer. And in many cases, that is as simple as defining what you do in the offer. Let me give you an example. A client that was a consultant for auto dealers. So his business actually went to auto dealers and he would do all the online marketing for the auto dealers themselves. He had 
he had more than a hundred steps in the systems that he followed for the dealers. I mean, there was so much that they did on pay-per-click, they did SEO, they did all these different pieces. I think it was like 130 steps that he had in his spreadsheet that his team went through and did for each client. Just mentioning that as part of his offer that they had this types of steps and here's a list of some of the steps they're gonna do for the business. That was an impressive way to add to the offer because his clients will hear something like that and they don't wanna do that. They're not gonna do that themselves in marketing, but just going through and actually saying, here's all the stuff that we include in the offer because your customers don't know what's included. They don't know what it's required to get this job done for them. And so they don't know what you're actually doing. So a lot of times going in and being more specific on exactly what you do and how it can benefit them will add in and it makes an irresistible offer in another type of business in a product retail type business an irresistible offer might be something as simple as, okay, you're going to get two for one. We're running a two for one special. It might be, you're going to get these extra bonuses. You're going to get this extra di discount. It's, and it's telling you why it's telling the reason why we're making this offer as part of that as well. And, and you have to buy it within 48 hours or 24 hours. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the fifth finger. finger of oh, the that's the fifth. Okay. Yep. See, you. you jumped right ahead of me. Reason, reason to act nail. You're already ahead of that. Reason to act is, now, yeah. It's the reason to act now. Why should we take action now? And on a website, a lot of times we can't do a real strong reason to act now. We can't say, hey, you have to buy this within the next 24 hours because we want a website that actually sits there and stays there all the time. So with the reason to act now on the website, a lot of times we'll talk about going back up. Okay, what happens if they don't take action now? I'll use the chiropractor example because that's a really easy one. For the chiropractor, they could, they'll could end up at the end of the website. We'll talk about the fact, okay, what if they don't come and get treatment? Well, the condition could continue to get worse. They could just, they're masking the pain with drugs while the, the root cause continues to go untreated. The problem gets worse. They might even end up needing surgery and not being able to be treated. So that's something like that we'll mention pretty quickly at the end as a reason act now, because here's what's happened if you don't take action now of this. Now, if we were doing an email, we are definitely going to have our deadlines for our offers and emails. This ends on Friday at midnight, or as every retail store knows, hey, this is a Black Friday special. This is going to end on this day. It's right now it's ending. And we do that a lot by email or any type of short-term offer that we can run. Or like a, a pop-up window on the website. Yeah. That... We, we can do that as well. Although a lot yeah. of times we want the answer. So you go back to those five fingers and it's amazing just how much that can transform your results just looking for those five pieces. You want to just you, repeat them, uh, list them again? Just what okay. are they again? They are, the five fingers are desperate problem, unique promise, overwhelming proof, an irresistible offer, and a reason to act now. And as I said, all five fingers came from me doing all these website reviews for all these clients over these last couple of decades where I needed to find, okay, what are we missing really quickly on this website? So it almost became... It was originally my cheat sheet in my own head that I went through constantly. Okay, you're showing me a website. Which finger are you missing on the website? And then I started teaching it later on after I seen, okay, this is what, how it works. And it works consistently for improving leads, conversion sales. And it doesn't matter what type of website it is. That's what's really beautiful about these five fingers is it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It still goes back to these five pieces in all of your uh, marketing. It it aligns with the process that the buyer needs to go through in their head mm -hmm. and heart in order to be convinced to stop shopping and buy here, or at least, mm -hmm. you know, make that inquiry. So it's kind of aligning the mm -hmm. selling with the buying process is how I see it. It is. And how much time is spent on each of those five fingers greatly depends on what you're offering. And if I'm offering a free lead magnet on my website to get someone to opt into a list or ask for more information, then my website's usually going to be pretty short. We're going to go through the five fingers very quickly on the website. If this is a longer type offer, let's say that we're selling a coaching type offer, and this might be a $15,000, $20,000 sale. We might have a lot of content on the website and then with an application form for a free call on the website. So if we're selling an e-commerce product, again, how likely is the customer to already know what we're selling. The more they already know about the product and how it works, the shorter the page is gonna be. It might be a very short page with a picture and we might only have a sentence or two for each of the five fingers for that. If it's a brand new invention, the same website might be three or four printed pages answering the five questions. It all depends mm -hmm. on where the customer is in the process and their understanding of the offer and the price point of the offer.
So you really have to customize the mm -hmm. seller to what the needs are of the buyer based on the type of product or service, how well known it is, or mm -hmm. how complex it is. And that, I guess that's your job to decipher, help decipher with the client. It is, but I mean, a lot of this comes back to a little bit of common sense as well, because right. you could also think, what are your current sales processes in your business? Is this the type of sell that somebody makes an instant gratification decision for? Okay, I'm selling a $20 widget on a retail store. Well, that's a quick, pretty quick decision for most customers. I'm selling a $100,000 business to business service. Well, that's not an easy decision. We're going to have a lead generation service. We're going to probably have what we'd call a sideways, sideways website, which means somebody will opt in to get information. We'll likely send them a PDF. We'll likely send them some videos. We'll follow up. It's the whole process to follow up, but they still are all based on the five fingers of the golden glove. But again, it just comes back to the common sense of how difficult of a decision is it that the customer has to make at this point in time. Now, before we started the recording, we were chatting a bit, and you talked about uh, the importance of follow-up, mm -hmm. and I really see that. I mean, I, I was approached a couple of weeks ago by somebody selling phone services, you know, IP, uh, IP phones, which I already have, but I'm not that happy with the service, and he sent me a quote, and with, you know, what comes with the service which, and it was actually cheaper than I'm paying now. And I thought, okay, this could be interesting to explore a little bit further, but he never followed up with me. And, you know, the, you forget it, you go off and, you know, do your thing. You got so many uh, fires burning or projects on the go. So let's talk about a, a follow up with online, uh, you know, because when, let's say you're a manufacturer, you go to a trade show. And even then, I've seen that so often, you know, you have your reps, you have, you make all this effort to make a beautiful presence at this trade show. And you get all these leads, maybe you have a lead magnet, that you're giving something away in exchange to get somebody's contact info. And then you get you go back to work, you go back to your office, and you have so many leads that you can't you don't have enough resources to follow them all up and you haven't qualified them well mm -hmm. and they just fall through the cracks and you lose so much potential business. So how do you uh, work with your clients as far as the follow-up on online selling? Well, I'll say this for the follow-up, especially in the scenario you just brought up, because I like to work with specific scenarios. If someone came back from a trade show and they had a whole bunch of leads, we would definitely want to import them into an email system that we could mail merge and contact everybody on a mass scale with broadcast first, which we'd load them in. We would start sending out emails. And when I say emails, I like what I call a content marketing approach. And it's a little bit of personality as well. So it almost comes back to, again, don't use just somebody who's the best technical writer. Okay, now I have to say technical writer here because if somebody's a good writer, then they'll also they'll often write personably. Okay, they'll they'll have personal touch in their writing. I, I again go back to okay, do we have the best salesperson? I want a writer who also knows about selling because I want to send out emails that have a little bit of a personal touch. And I always tell people that they need to include stories in some of the emails. So some of these emails, I would want to have case studies from other clients that I would be talking about in this case, because often the best stories you can tell are case studies from other clients. So I would want to organize and plan out a sequence of emails to send to everybody. Often the primary goal of these emails is to get someone to reply back because the moment somebody replies back, so I'm going to constantly ask them questions in these emails. Hey, if you have any questions about this, reply back. Hey, if you're having this issue, reply back and we'll help give you a custom quote. And then when people reply back, hopefully those can be funneled off to specific salespeople who can follow up on the specific people who basically raise their hand and say, hey, I want more information. But these emails, I always call them the three E approach. I like my little systems here to follow through it. And that is entertain, educate, earn. What does that mean? Entertain means I'm going to start off the emails usually with some type of story, some type of attention grabbing story. A lot of cases, let me just give an example here, is we might start off with a problem that a client came to us with. You know, and our, my very beginning of the email might say something along the lines of, 
hey, a client came to me with this problem, outline the problem, okay? The educational section would be, I would teach something often about the root cause of the problem, okay? Once we went in and investigated, we found out that this was actually the root cause of the problem. And the reason I would be teaching that is because that would likely be the root cause of a lot of the people reading this problem as well. Not all of them, but some of them. So that's my little educational section. I always have this process, any of, any of my emails or any of my clients' emails, somebody would gain valuable information, we'll call it useful or incomplete information at least, by reading the emails, even if they never purchased from me. So they gained value just from being on the email list. And then after the education, there'll be the earn section, which is my call to action. We're going to have some call to action on the email that hooks into the case study. So in this type of email, if I were saying, okay, here's the problem that we solved, here's what was the root cause of the problem in this case, then my call to action at the end would be, hey, if you're suffering a problem like this or something similar to this, hey, please reply back, call back to me or call this number, and we'll see what we can do for you in your case. And again, I'm doing this on a general terms because we, we haven't discussed what type of business this is for, but people could see if this was an e-commerce store, I would be having them reply back, send them to a specific sales page on the website. The call to action would apply to both the email, whatever the problem is that we can help the customer solve, and the next action I want them to take. So again, in a business to business place, it's gonna almost always be reply or call in the call to action because the next basis, we can't sell by email for a very high ticket offer, a high ticket service offer. We get them on the phone to actually close the sale, but we use the email to sell without selling. We'll build in a relationship so that once they're on the phone with us, they're ready to buy. They just have questions at that point. You just have to make sure the custom solution is for them. So that's what we put together. So we put together a whole email sequence. And when I say a sequence, it's going to be the kind of sequence where I tell my clients never to end the sequence on the calls. It's going to be, we're going to send, we might send that first month. We might send 10 emails the first month, again, depending on the topic. But I always tell them to send at least one email a week from then on to follow up on these processes because it's really interesting. I've had customers who come to me and they've hired me for a higher ticket coaching offer two years after they joined my list. See, that's a long time. And they didn't purchase anything before that. They never raised their hand. They never replied to anything. And all of a sudden they purchased. You were building the, uh, I guess, the credibility and the trust. So when the problem became uh, I guess, where when they were timing was right and the problem mm -hmm. was bothering them enough, they, mm -hmm. you were the person they thought of because they had, you had built a relationship with them through your content marketing. Yeah, yes. And that's just something you continually do. And as I said, the content marketing, people make it, it sounds complicated. Content marketing is simply giving value in, a, in an entertaining way, some way. And a lot of that's telling stories, giving case studies, your own cast history. Here's a story that I like almost every business to tell within the first week or two that somebody's on the email sequence. And that's the origin story. Why did you start this business? What's behind this business? Why was it important to you? Why is right. helping your clients important to you? That's, right. that's a simple question that you answer in an email. And that really helps you bond with your prospects because it's you'll notice that a lot of businesses don't do it. They don't tell why they're in this business. And if you don't tell why you're in the business, you're just like everybody else. You're another commodity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about the three E's. I'm thinking of uh, mm -hmm. a very obvious example when done well are TV commercials, but now more like uh, those little short videos on new products that solve a problem. And uh, there's a call to action at the end, which sometimes is irresistible not to click on to find out how much does that cost, you know? And when it's done really well, you can convert somebody just through that video uh, to a, a landing page where, you, you know, they place an order. Um, so that's a, a, an obvious example that I think we've all seen with, through social media. So that's a lot of valuable information you provided. Is there a uh, free resource that, I mean, you have the uh, five uh, fingers, the three E's. Is there something that uh, somebody can go to to download? Do you have an ebook or something that we could uh, offer to send people to? Well, I'm going to recommend everybody go over to Terry Dean. Dot com. That's and I'll put a I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes and description of the video. 
Okay. No, so it's T-E-R-R-Y-D-E-A-N.com. And at terrydean.com, you can pick up, it's an, it's an opt-in because this is a lead magnet. You can pick up a copy of my golden glove cheat sheet, which goes over the five fingers. It gives you the five questions as well. Plus it comes with a three video series. Each video is about 10 minutes long. So it's not going to take a lot of your time that go into detail about the overall golden glove, a little bit more than what I covered today on specifics of how to use it. The, the next two videos cover the desperate problem in detail and then the unique promise in detail specifically. So they can help you, especially with those areas and following up and using the golden glove on your website, in your emails, in your videos, in, in all of your marketing. So grab that over at terrydean.com. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. And um, again, I'll put a link to that. Uh, you did send it to me, I recall now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I love it. It's very practical and very real. I mean, uh, I know I've created so many websites that haven't converted. Mm -hmm. And um, I see the problem just listening to you. It's, it's so obvious. Uh, what's the one question that I should have asked you that would give great value to our audience? Um, Is there one? You, well, I, I don't know, because you, you, you asked really good questions, and we covered the step-by-step -step process of the Golden Glove. And as I said, when they pick up the cheat sheet, they're just going to, I would tell people to grab the cheat sheet, ask themselves the five questions. Go. I would tell people to immediately download it, go ask yourself the five questions while looking at your website. And anywhere you fail, just think of some quick ways to improve it because a lot of times there's some really quick ways to improve it. And I already mentioned the proof point is one of the biggest ones that they have proof high disease. And I'll give you one more last one that you could have asked about that. And it's on the unique promise. The other big issue that really comes up often is people hide their promise. And they, it's like they're afraid to consciously make a big promise and say how they can really help their customers. And a lot of times, especially in service businesses, this is because they don't want to offend their peers or stand out from their peers. And never ever write your marketing communication for your peers. You're writing it for your customers. That means you got to look for any jargon that you use. You got to make sure that there's no jargon in that the customers aren't going to understand. You got to make sure that you define the terms that you use because you're writing for customers not for peers. If your website impresses your peers, especially your peers that aren't selling well, <laughs> there's always a lot of those in any field, field. If a lot of your peers like your website and you know that those peers aren't great sellers themselves, your website's probably not very good. <laughs> That's the answer for that. Because you're not impressing peers, you want to generate leads and customers. That's what you want from your website. Well, that brings up another question I have. Um doing this, like actually writing this for your own website, uh, I would think uh, it would be much better. I know it's much better. I just want to hear it from you mm -hmm. to have a professional write that, you know, even if you're a good writer, it's harder to write for your own stuff, uh, you know, than having somebody professional mm -hmm. from the outside do that. What's, I just want to hear your take on that. You're, you're, you're exactly right. It's going to be very, you're going to be benef beneficial to hire somebody else to write it for you. And I'll give you a big condition here. When you hire somebody else to write it for you, they need to be someone who actually wants to interview you and talk to you. If someone just says, Hey, I'm going to go fix your website without speaking to you directly. They don't know what they're doing. That's the answer for it because they're going to speak to you directly. They're going to ask you some of the same questions you see me asking here. They would ask you questions from the golden glove or very similar questions because they likely have their own system as well, because you want to make sure that this again speaks to your customers. And a lot of times it's hard to see the forest for the trees. You don't actually see the missing pieces because you're so um, used to your industry. You're so used to speaking to, again to your own peers instead of speaking to customers that you don't know what you, basically your customers don't know what they don't know. And you don't know the questions they're asking in many cases. Great. Somebody from when somebody from an outside viewpoint would know those because they're going to be uh, curious. Yeah, I've discovered that lately too. As I just did hire a copywriter mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of landing pages, I'm create I created and I would never have written that way. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll say this: it, it's fantastic. Know, I don't know uh, your experience with him, but usually a good copywriter is going to ask you a few questions you wouldn't have thought of before they even start writing. 
Oh yeah, we did. Yeah. And I provided some good information. Mm -hmm. Well, Terry, it was uh, very informative, educational. Uh, I was entertained <laughs> and um, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for providing the cheat sheet, which we'll put a link to and also to your website. Uh, for those that uh, haven't already subscribed to the channel or the podcast, please do so, so you get news of new videos. I'm doing regular guest interviews uh, frequently right now and uh, getting a lot of valuable information from these professionals. Uh, check out also the blog section of my website for articles that go along with the videos. Uh, thank you again, Terry. It's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone for 